mentioned earlier, and in which I thank them very much for, for coming over here. It's a, such a chunk of time for you uh, to take out of your busy lives, and I really thank you. I think it was a terrific presentation. So, uh, Dwight Holland and uh, Dorothy Long and I got this moderate uh, conference going many years ago, and uh, because I was the program manager, it had a, a, a very strong English wood firing focus for many years, and uh, this may be the last one that Dwight uh, is organizing, so it's, it's a kind of appropriate, but it's also got this English theme. And um, Dwight is, is a very cunning old soul, and uh, I have never uh, looked at my past before he asked me to for this particular talk. And uh, as you know, I was born near stoke on trent in England, and uh, my family background has been in industrial ceramics. And uh, I'm going to uh, tell you something about it. So, uh, this is my story. It's basically divided into three parts. There's one that's just a sort of a history, very brief history of Stoke on Trent and some of the, some of the makers uh, historically. And then a little discussion of uh, social history and uh, of the pottery world at that time in the 19th century mostly. And then finally, um, sort of a, a, a memoir. Growing up there. Uh, so, the, the early Stoke uh, pottery scene was very rustic, and during the 17th century, you've got these wonderful English slipware dishes made by William Taylor and Thomas Toft. Uh, and then the Industrial Revolution happened, and various different potters began to move into Stoke on Trent and uh, standardize production in a more industrial way uh, because usually at that time pots were uh, uh, in people's houses were coming from Southeast Asia, from China, and all the porcelain trade that was uh, happening at the time. And this is the sort of ware that was commissioned by uh, British people uh, uh, to be made by Chinese potters. This was actually made for a man called Admiral Anson, who fought with Lord Nelson. And it was made uh, in China and exported from Canton. But you can imagine that the seas being uh, rough and uh, uh, the, the journey back to Europe was arduous, but many people began experimenting with uh, porcelain manufacture and um, one of those characters was Thomas Wielden, who made pots in Stoke on Trent at the beginning of the 18th century. His, his dates are 1790 to 1795. And uh, he made wonderful pots like this agate wire coffee pot and this lovely tortoise uh, shell ware. Uh, I know Doug has been dusting his pots with manganese and causing it to melt and drip. These guys were doing it back again in the early 18th century. Early, yeah, 19th century, right? Early 18th century. And uh, there's the singularly beautiful parts. And uh, I just can't get enough of these. They're just so pretty. And they were it's not made by hand. They were all everything. Well, they were made by hand, but not by one person. It was all the like all the parts were divided up. There was the clay makers, the, uh, the mold makers, the the pot, you know, people soot casting and so on. But uh, then came Wedgwood, and Wedgwood was trained by Wheelton, as was uh, Josiah Spode. In fact, Josiah Spode started life as an apprentice with uh, Wielding when he was 16, and he was paid a weekly uh, wage of two shillings and threepence, or two and six if he deserved it. And it's also an account of, uh, this is in Wielding's notebooks, of uh, a little a girl called Bette Bloor being hired for one shilling and threepence to put on flowers on his wear. And I know my apprentices were also uh, 
recognize the, 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 the small, the low wages that they received. But anyway, Spoke was there for four years, and Wedgwood was there just immediately after Spoke. And Wedgwood, of course, is the dominant character uh, when thinking about industrial Spoke on Trent. And his great uh, skills were twofold. One, he was a, a brilliant partner, but he was also a fantastic business person. He built the Trent and Mersey Canal, which connect the, connected the river uh, Mersey up in Liverpool with the river Trent. And uh, it enabled clay to be brought up from down in Cornwall, all the Chinese clays and all clays, uh, for uh, the partisan stoke to manufacture white ware, uh, because as you saw, the Thomas Toft uh, and William Taylor plants were all red earthenware, which is what uh, clay there is uh, naturally around Stoke on Trent. Uh, so they were able to bring up the ball clay to be manufactured into whiteware, but they also were able, the canals were used to ferry pots down uh, to market because at that time, uh, Tarmac Adam was not on the roads, all the roads were potholed, and so all the pots would break on the way to market. Um, and, but Wedgwood was also a brilliant marketer, uh, and I didn't realize until uh, studying for this. Uh, presentation, but in fact he developed a lot of the techniques for marketing that we all use now, like door-to-door uh, -door sales salesmanship, uh, money-back guarantees, um, let's see, direct mail, and uh, also buy one, get one free, <laughs> and illustrated catalogs. Uh, it also should be noted that he was a prominent abolitionist and uh, was also the grandfather of Charles Darwin. So uh, this is uh, Wedgwood creamware that was made for Queen Catherine of uh, Russia. And there's a frog in the top, and apparently St. Petersburg was in the mar it's a march, and there were lots of frogs. And uh, Wedgwood capitalized on uh, marketing to all the aristocracy in Russia and got photographs or drawings of their estates that he transferred to creamware, which is what this uh, white earthenware was known as. And of course, Wedgwood is most notably, uh, uh, most well known for his jasperware, and all the sort of craze for neo neoclassical imagery. And uh, he did very well for himself. This is uh, went vast and Hall, uh, outside this town of Stoke and Trent, between Stoke and Trent, where I grew up in the little town of Stone. And um, yeah, it's interesting to look at Potter's houses and to so observe uh, uh, how well industrialists have done over the years. Uh, but Josiah Spoke, as I said, worked for Wealdon early on. Uh, but his family was poor, he was orphaned at age six and uh, buried his father in a pauper's grave and went to work with Wilton and even worked briefly alongside Wedgwood and started his company, Spoke, in 1776. And what, uh, it started making creamware to begin with. Uh, uh, this is very, very early Spoke. Uh, including this kind of interesting work called caneware and a lot of the early 18th century manufacturers, late 18th century manufacturers were making this cane ware. Uh, and also, this is Spoke's Jasper ware. They all sort of copied each other. Uh, but Spoke's main uh, invention was to perfect the uh, creation of underglazed earthenware transfer printing. Uh, and this is a, a Chinese shard that was found on Spoke's site. And Spoke figured out how to um, create, a well, uh, you know, these well, create a piece of paper that could be uh, put onto these engravings and then transferred onto diskware. And I've got a sequence of images about this. It starts out, you've got the engraver uh, cutting into a copper plate, and then the copper plate is brushed with ink, or it's rubbed in. And then the ink, this extra ink is, is scraped off. And then there's a technique known as bossing, where you, uh, you flatten it all and warm, you warm the plate up and you 
get all the, the, the copper plate all clean, etc. The, uh, the engraving. And then you run it through a roller, so like a mangle. And uh, then you peel it off, the peel off the paper. And then the paper gets cut into its different segments. And then it's rubbed onto the surface of the plate. And the paper is floated off and it's fired. And you get this one of the print. And so that's, uh, I suppose, lesser known invention. Uh, and you have all these wonderful 19th, 18th, 19th century scenes of distant lands. And this is uh, Spode's Blue Italian, which was first created in 1813 and is still in production. And uh, it's perhaps his most famous pattern. And, but it wasn't all blue and white, they also did some different colored kind of transfer printing. But this is Bone China, this is Spode's best known uh, invention. And he essentially standardized uh, a clay body that was translucent, but wasn't fired at such high temperatures in, in, in mimicry of porcelain. And you can see that translucence here in this image. And the recipe, perfected in about 1790, um, was six parts bone ash, four parts Cornish stone, and three and a half parts kale. And um, it's interesting to note that over the course of time from 1800, Spode had in their patent book 75,000 different patents. Um, and here's some other examples of Spode's porcelain and a lot of them then earthenware. Um, and this is the house that Spode built. This is out just above um, Stoke in the, in the borough of Penkel, and it's called the Mount. And it's still there, and I was there in February and wanted to go and have a look at it. And it's, uh, it's now being converted, it's a school. Uh, and uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. But Spode had a son, uh, Josiah Spode II, who was a merchant. And it's very interesting also to note how successful partnerships can be between somebody who's a very good potter and somebody who's a very good marketer. Uh, and what Wedgwood what seems to be combine the two, but Spoke was essentially the potter and the inventor. But his son uh, set up in London, they had a, a shop on Portugal Street, and um, continued making all this wonderful bone china. But they got uh, some royal patronage. They uh, encouraged all the wealthy at the time to to buy their work, and there's a lovely quote that I read, it said, by 1830, Spoke China, uh, vases, inkstands, and scent jars decorated the most elegant houses. Bone China tea and dessert, uh, dessert service graced the most fashionable dining tables of England, and blue-printed earthenware dinner services were, stealth, uh, was a, were a staple of any self-respecting home. In 1847, they also made basalt ware. Um, but in 1847, Spode employed 1,000 people. They had 70, seven biscuit kilns, 14 glaze kilns, and 16 enamel kilns. Um, and also at the height of their production, and this was even you know, post Second World War, the number of pieces that were made at Spode, they made 110,000 pieces a week. That's pretty remarkable. And they made a lot of this earthenware. This some of this, they did a lot of, of hunt scenes. Um, and this is William, uh, I think that, well, whoever this is, I think this is one of the Copelands, but there's a story of Spode the third I want to share. Because in 1802, the factory purchased a new Bolton and Watt steam engine to supplement an old 1779 engine that was driving the grinding mill and possibly providing power for throwing wheels and turning lathes. At the opening ceremony for the new engine, despite Josiah Spoke III suffered a horrific accident, he was inspecting the operations when a crown wheel struck his hat 
and in lifting his arm to protect himself, the hand passed between the cogs of the wheel, and immediate amputation became indispensable. He retired to live as a country gentleman, and on his father's death, took re residence in the Mount, and died two years later. And it's interesting that Spoke the first had been orphaned at age six, and buried in Corpus grave, blessed, as I said. But Spoke the fourth was orphaned, also at age six, but inherited 100,000 pounds, which in today's value would be about 8,250,000. 8, so again, the, the amount of money that was made by the industrialists during the Industrial Revolution and the widening of the British Empire, the markets that were opening up everywhere. It's pretty amazing. Um, and uh, so Spode ended up selling out to one of his partners, uh, William Taylor Co uh, Copeland, uh, who in turn partnered with Mr. Garrett and uh, the Copeland factory. Copeland's owned the company until 19, 2006, I think, when it finally closed. No, or, yeah, or thereabouts. But uh, that's kind of the end of the little history that I've got. And, uh, I've got this little piece about the social history. I want to start out with a rather grim reading about uh, a poor young boy, aged 12 and a half, called William Barden, who worked in the biscuit warehouse. Uh, he started at Copeland and Garrett at the age of nine and a half when he began working in the dipping house where lead made me bad. Dipping biscuit earthenware into tubs of lead glaze was described uh, by a government official, Scriven, who went around documenting conditions in industrial factories throughout uh, Lancashire, Yorkshire, and all the you know, textile mills up there. And, and came through Stoke to make observations about the working conditions. And uh, uh, he wrote that it was a pernicious and destructive process. Uh, the toxic occupation affected the nervous system and was particularly dangerous for children. Charles Barker, a worker in the dipping house, noted that his fellow workers, four men and eleven boys, all had been afflicted with cramp and pains. The boys had taken in fits sometimes because the worker, workers, uh, but because the workers considered more pernicious than any other, we get better wages. Upon average, the men got thirty shillings a week. Uh, so this was sort of conditions in Stoke on Trent. And a very influential book for me when I was growing up was this book called When I Was a Child, written by Charles Shaw, uh, who worked in the pottery industry uh, from a very tender age. Uh, I'll read you a little brief description from it. Uh, uh, he, they lived next door to a man, a, a, a woman who had a son called Jack, who was an apprentice at the potworks and a muffin maker. His mother, knowing the poverty of my parents, suggested I should become Jack's mold runner. It was necessary to explain that a muffin maker was one who made small plates less than seven inches diameter. Such a workman needed a mold runner. These molds were a cast of plaster on which the clay was laid in something like the shape of a pancake. The clay was pressed by the wet right hand of the maker upon the plaster mold, which was being spun around by a rolling disc by his left hand. The plate maker got a wet tool which he pressed upon the clay, and this gave the outer surface the required shape. By this tool, the foot ring of the plate was formed on which it stands when used. The plate had gone through these processes. The plaster on which it had been made quickly had to be carried away by the boy help into a, top, uh, into a hot room with a stove close by, hence the term mold runner. The stove was a room four or five yards square, shelled all around at regular intervals in which the plaster molds were placed. And basically the boy had, they had to run up and down with these mold rooms, with, with these molds. And uh, uh, in addition to it, it being extremely hot work, there was also the danger of drunkenness. And uh, uh, you know, the, the potters, the, the makers would be given their wages uh, at the pubs. And so the workers would go and get their pubs, and the, the publicans would oblige them to start drinking. And there are tales recounted in that book of uh, distraught mothers, wives, and children coming into the pubs, and all the money would have been spent by Friday night. And um, there was something called Saint Monday. And Saint Monday 
was all, it was the day where there was no production because everybody was drunk and hungover. And then Tuesday they were still recovering. And so by the time Wednesday came along, the workers were obliged to make up their week in much less time. And they would beat the boys. And there's a horrific account of uh, this young man being whipped uh, to get the production uh, made. But, yeah, I mean, those were the conditions. It was all coal fired. And the facts, one of the stories that I remember being uh, raised with is that when you were thinking of getting married, you would take your the prospective bride up onto Shelton Bank to look down on Stoke on Trent. And if your intended didn't mind the view, she'd do. <laughs> <laughs> but here's some, this is a series of pictures of uh, what the factory looked like uh, during the 19th century. Um, it's, the, the images skip from then to some 1950s and 60s. But this is a, a mold runner, you know, uh, a fellow has got a jigger arm and the mold runner would run the plates to the hot stone and bring them back. And, uh, you know, lots of people working in these factories. Uh, and women too, you know, pouring uh, slip into molds. Um, but spoke like, you know, the cotton mill houses and the cotton mill, uh, this is a mill row that houses built by Spoke for his workers. And, um, uh, and Charles Dickens wrote some of the very amusing paper about his visit to, uh, to Stoke at one point. And, uh, and they, this is the handle making and throwing. There was a certain amount of uh, throwing done at Spode, even when I was coming up. And this is what the throwing kind of boiled down to when I used to go to the factory. They were making little funny little stubs that they would then put into a mold, and the clay would be forced against the, uh, the inside of that mold with a rib. And then perhaps a jigger arm was brought in to make the shape after which it was popped out and a foot trimmed on a horizontal lathe. And uh, lots of work being done, scalloping and cleaning. Here's a little boy making a press mold handle. Uh, and here's a fellow slapping a piece of clay down onto a mold to be made into a plate. So there was a, a certain amount of hand production uh, all divided into specialties. Uh, and of course, most of the wear was slip cast, <coughs> molds having been made, the slip poured into the molds, which were then broken apart uh, to reveal uh, a coffee pot, which was then pierced and stuck put on. And uh, there was some handwork. I mean, that's a little uh, upright creamer. So it's a shape called low stock with a braided handle and, a, and even a hand pulled spout. And that's what they look like after firing. And uh, people making sprigs for the jasper wear. And uh, this was one of the uh, poster girls for this industry in Stoke on Trent, uh, sort of you know, vintage 1960s, uh, decorating a pattern called Gainsborough. And this is a woman who'd worked there, this was her, on her 82nd birthday. So, getting flowers and fruit and presents and so on. Uh, burnishing gold, an awful lot of the, uh, the ware was gilded and, and really, you know, very attractive. Uh, and then carried, you know, one-handed, these great boards of long boards of pots being carried from uh, the shop into towards the kiln. This is a shot, a uh, picture there of sagger making. And one of those people there, probably the guy on the right, is the sagger maker's bottom knocker. You make a wall, and then you put the, the put, excuse me, you put the, the bottom on the sagger, and you sort of got, tap the sagger out the mold, and that's the sagger maker's bottom knocker's job. And and then the saggers would all be packed and set and carried on your head. 
and then they would uh, take them into the kiln, climb up step ladders, and uh, be, the stag is putting great buns up to the top of the crown. And here's a, an image of the inside of one of those bottle ovens. And there's still a few in Stoke on Trent, but they've mostly been torn down. There's a, a pretty famous uh, working museum called the Gladstone Pottery. If you are ever at there, it's all well worth going to. And I actually was present at one of the you know, historic uh, refiring, an exhibition of, of firing one of those kilns. It's pretty interesting. Uh, shoving coal into the firebox. Uh, and then, in 1956, there was the Clean Air Act, and you can see the before and after. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, my father at one point was the president of the Pottery and Glass Benevolent Fund, which had been set up to help care for people who were the victims of industrial accidents, and also of uh, all the diseases like silicosis, which were around them in the pottery industry at the time. In fact, where I was born in the little town of Stone, just out of Stoke, we used to walk the dog, you know, go up the road and out into the meadows, and the other side of the meadows was a flint mill, and flint was ground into uh, dust for use in the pottery industry. And the average life expectancy was apparently 40 years. You, you, you know, men never lived beyond the age of 40 when you started working in dusty flint mills. And all of those things were, I kind of threw that book, you know, when I was growing up. It, it's funny, you get to a certain stage and you look back at where you're from. And even though those conditions were gone, the clean air acts were happen, had happened, there was a way that I sort of felt personally responsible for it. Or I thought my parents, my father and the, the, his forebears were directly responsible for all the, the, you know, the, the, the faults of the industrial system. But of course, they weren't. Um, but these are the sort of kilns that uh, were built after the Clean Air Act, all these tunnel kilns that stretched a long, long way. You can see all these pots lining up and going into the kilns. And I remember going around Spode with my dad, and at one point you can see the, the tunnel kilns, that they're basically there's a trolley running through, they're really long, and they, there's a, a heat source in the middle, in the middle, and the heat kind of radiates to either end. And there's a timing sequence that pulls the, the trolleys through the kiln. And I remember walking into these kilns with them empty but lit and uh, going as far as you could, which was not very far, and walking back. It's like walking into hell and kind of turning, <laughs> turning back. And I, you know, I remember, you know, uh, uh, Dan was talking about everybody doffing their caps in the villages. And that would happen when I'd walk around with my dad. You know, they say, morning, Mr. Gordon, and they, um, and, uh, you know, after the firing, all the pots would be inspected and packed in wood wall, all the straw, and shipped here and there in these great barrels. And, uh, and that's a picture, a rendering by uh, a, a man called Harold Holdway. Of the spode works during the 50s and 60s, I think. And this is a really interesting picture. This is the, uh, the, the, uh, the wages were in that wheelbarrow. And it was trundled up to the front office. And then there was like, it's like the perp walk. All the, all the workers would go up and get their, get their money. Uh, and they had their fun playing cricket uh, out in the back and also playing football. And, um, and of course there was always the royal visits. This is, I think, Princess Margaret. Uh, so Spode kind of did pretty well. But um, that's sort of the end of my little history. Uh, and now comes the memoir. Uh, so here's the map of England. You've got Stoke on Trent in the middle. And Wenker Bridge, which people know from Michael Cartu, and then there's this village of uh, Buckley, or a town of Buckley in North Wales, which uh, Doug had referred to. And in fact, that's where my forebears are from, on the Hewitt side. There's a little village outside Buckley called Ulo, E W L O E, and I think there must be some 
uh, connection between the hue and hue. My family, my forebears, ended up pushing their wagon from Buckley to Stoke-on Trent back in the 1830s because things in Buckley weren't too good and uh, Stoke-on Trent was booming and so they pushed the wagon. And they ended up uh, in a place called Cinder Hill. And Cinder Hill at that time was a, a slag heap for the coal industry. And there was a shanty town on Cinder Hill that is now an industrial estate. This is a picture I took about a month ago when I went to visit my dad. And uh, it's, it's, you know, an unprepossessing, you know, if industrial estate on the outskirts of Stoke. Uh, but the next generation, they started a brick company in a place called Fence and Low, which was actually just around the corner from uh, Minton's and Dalton's. And I mean, it's right there in the thick of things. And uh, Dad brought over that brick for me one time. I got it, uh, uh, got it back in the house. And that company ended up making uh, refractory bricks, among other things. And I worked right there one horrible summer. They were specialised in making bricks that were put into night storage heaters, which were sort of supersized and able to retain more heat than other types of brick. And uh, very heavy, and I was not prepared for that. Um, but anyway, they made these uh, stilts and cranks and props for setting in uh, other kilns. And the pottery, you know, that, that brick company did pretty well because they were making all the bricks that made the buildings that all the pottery factories were made of and all the kilns were made of. And, but sadly, it's out of business, and this is not far from Cinder Hill. That's the, the, the remnant that's no longer there, but the, the sign is still out on the street. Um, and that's a picture of my grandfather, um, A.E. Hewitt, or Ted Hewitt, who uh, fought in the First World War, came out and got started. It was, it was his uncle who owned the, the Hewitt Brick Company. And he, because he was born in Stoke, ended up working uh, uh, in one of the industries. And there was a company called Jackson and Gosling, and he took that over. They manufactured porcelain, uh, or China, you know, China clay, uh, bone china rather. And they, um, they'd done really well. And so the Copeland brothers hired him as the managing director of Stoke. And uh, he also became the Lord Mayor of Stoke at one point. And he's the fellow with the bling. And uh, the other fellow was the Kukukuk King, George the Fifth, who was stammering King George, who got King through the Second World War. And uh, so behind him is my grandmother and uh, the Queen Mother. And that's one of those state visits that I always think of that's the little bit like a picture of Bill Clinton shaking Kennedy's hand. Do you know that? Um, Anyway, that's my dad on the, on the right and his uh, brother Peter in their school uniform. And Uncle Peter was shot down over Belgium on his first flight in Lancaster Bomber where he was a rear gunner. So uh, that's another part of the whole history. But after the war, uh, my father met my mother. And this was their engagement party. My mother was born in South Africa and uh, she came, well, see. Her real mother died when she was two of pneumonia, and my grandfather, who was an anchor in a small coal mining community in, in, South, in Natal, Newcastle, uh, had remarried a woman whose brother and who, no, uh, her, her stepmother's sister had married a, a, one of the Harris brothers who owned Buller's China. Um, and Buller's manufactures electrical porcelain. And if you want to know what electrical porcelain is, it's this stuff that you see on the top of uh, uh, electrical pylons. And there's a very particular type of uh, huge stack that you see in electrical substations. And these are all extruded and carved, and it's an incredibly complicated uh, technique to get it to, everything to stand up straight as you can imagine. And, uh, but what was interesting about you know, the Harris brothers, Gilbert and Guy, they're all really tweedy English, you know, smoked a pipe and drove one of those old bull nose rovers. And they lived sort of up uh, in the next village from where I was raised. And we used to go and have tea with Aunt Tommy. Uh, 
And uh, but the, what they had, the, the other thing that Bullis did that's really interesting, there are all the systems for measuring temperature, that some of them are visual, some of them you have things that melt. And they, they figured out a system of, uh, to measure temperature by shrinkage. And all these little rings, Bullis rings, are formulated to shrink and fit into particular slots of different temperatures. And, uh, but they also, uh, the guy Harris, who's the technical whiz, we really loved uh, you know, chinoiserie and uh, developed all these amazing glazes. Um, there were copper reds and sublines and so on. But they also, that uh, little cup of pot at the top was part of a line of sort of sturdy functional wear that I remember as a child being served all this lovely comfort food, you know, apple crumbles and uh, rice puddings and so on. Uh, but they also hired various different people to come and work in the Shinwaz Reed studio in the little artwork department. This is a fellow called James Rushforth who painted these, so they're, they're always like Ming porcelain renditions that of English scenes. You know, some of the other canal, the, on the canal boat, there are sort of boys with backpacks going marching off in the country. They're really charming. There's a woman who used to teach down at Farnham Art School, Anita Hoy, which may be known that some of the English people know, who was also um, employed at, at uh, Bullers for a while. And there's a picture of, of my dad uh, leaning up against in the corner with uh, Robert and Spencer Copeland and a couple of American business people. And my father was the uh, sales manager. And uh, he used to travel around Europe, he spoke several different languages, speaks so several, he's still alive. And, um, uh, kind of it was old days, every, you sort of knew everybody by name. It wasn't computerized, and it was very much the sort of glad hand, the uh, soft, soft cell rather than the hard cell. And we used to have people from all over the place, somebody from Jamaica, the, the people who owned the store in Kingston would stay with us rather than staying in a hotel. And, uh, and mum would cook for these traveling business people. Uh, that's a picture of my grandpa. Um, yeah, but it was really interesting. At that time, Grandpa actually tried to get Spode to uh, get out of their old 19th century facilities in the same way that Wedgwood had. Wedgwood moved from Etruria on the banks of the Trenton Motor Canal to Barlaston, near Barlaston Hall, Wedgwood's home, and built a sort of a modern factory, more streamlined. And the Copeland brothers didn't. Uh, do that. They were going to build a pottery right next to the old Stoke City football ground in Booth. And, um, and the sort of fortunes of the company began slipping because they were working so in such inefficient uh, facilities. And, uh, but anyway, so that, this is where I was born. This uh, semi attached house. Uh, we were on the right hand side, Hunting Tree, Old Road, Stone, Stats. Uh, but interestingly, this is a, uh, just up the road on the other side was Alan Lee, whose father and uncle ran Burgess and Lee, which is where the, uh, the clay college is, you know, Burley Pottery. And uh, uh, we used to play soccer and do little pick-up games when we were kids on Granny Lee's lawn uh, with Alan and Kinsley. Uh, you know, so there was sort of a, you know, we, we sort of knew a lot of the people that um, that worked sort of managerial types within the pottery industry, and uh, you know, I have to show the bathing picture. Uh, <laughs> haven't changed a bit. <laughs> and there's my you know, one, we two bro two older brothers, you know, my middle brother James playing cricket there in the back. Uh, and this was the ware that we had as a, 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 on our table all the time. It's called uh, it was called Lunaville, and it's actually copied from a, a French Lunaville. Uh, you know, earthenware pattern, and they spoke about Sue because their copy had been so blatant and the name hadn't changed, so it ended up being called um, Marlborough Sprays. And the classic English teapot, you know, it's great reverence for tea, as everybody's been testing. Uh, but they also made other parts. This is another service we had called Pink Camilla, and a uh, very famous one called Blue Curls, which was in China. And my personal favourite when I was growing up, I had to have the most lavish in the world. It's called Blue Lancaster. Uh, really opulent, lots of gold. And they even did that in crimson. And um, 
And then uh, we, I was actually, I went to this exhibition, this was at the Royal College of Art in London in, in 1970 when I was 15 for the 200th anniversary of the opening of Spode. Great Rolls Royce and the Mini, you know, classic period of photograph, I love that. And, uh, and of course the other great thing about the living in Stoke is that you, you, uh, you fall in with the, the mighty potters, or rather not so mighty potters anymore, so in the second dimension of language in an 18th position, uh, but they eat out of win on Saturday, I have to say, but we did while I was in 1976, I think they won the League Cup, that's the only thing they ever won, and then Stanley Matthews was the great uh, English ringer, uh, uh, the wizard, and I went to his testimonial when he retired against the World Eleven that included Pele, Eusebio, Levy Ashen, the Russian goalkeeper, Pushkas from Hungary, who used to play for Real Madrid. And then this, there's Gordon Banks, the great goalkeeper from Stoke, just died the other day, and that's the famous save he made during the 1970 World Cup against uh, Mex Mexico. No, against Brazil. Pele hit that header and he saved it. Anyway, and there's Dad and I going to the games, you know, we used to have these great memories of. Uh, we, we'd go in with Dad on a Saturday morning, and there's sort of things that I remember. There were smells and the way that linoleum up to his office creaked. And, uh, and then we'd, we'd do a little bit of paperwork, and then we'd go and get the Kit Kat and the Victor and Valiant and go off to see Stoke play. And, uh, but again, it, I, I, you know, when I was a sort of a teenager, I used to look at these people and, uh, working and, and think that they were being oppressed in some way they weren't getting a fair shake and it was all wrong and, and uh, you know I've got a very different perspective on the benefits of employment if it's decent employment and you're not being abused you know it's very nice to have a job and um, but uh, there is increasing automation and standardization and this is pretty much this is Spode's Christmas tree which was the most important and uh, of their patterns, and uh, it's like a third of their production. But in the final de decades of the 20th century, there were huge changes in all the ceramic factories, and a lot of traditional methods were obsolete and inefficient. And uh, there was essentially a, a real change and a sort of de-skilling of the manufacturing process. And it was a great shame, and the number of people dwindled to next to nothing, and they didn't keep up. You know, and, and taste changed. It was no longer important to have a dowry item of China. Uh, people started eating out rather than eating at home. And then you've got designs that were Victorian and hadn't kept up with the times. And essentially, at a certain point, the uh, the company basically dwindled down to next to nothing. It was a great shame, and uh, it ended up getting sold. But, and my dad, towards the end, because of repeated takeovers, was obliged to go and work for a company making cabbage uh, called Cabbage Wall. And they did kind of really kind of low end stuff, in my opinion. And I must say that we took great pride in coming from Spode. And even when I was a child, if you uttered the word Wedgwood, you had to clean your mouth out of soap. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, just to, to get back to my story, was uh, after I left high school, I had a gap year before going to university, and I ended up working in Hamburg for a company that imported China from all over the place, including Spode. And I was sort of being groomed for industry, and there was a company called Algus Varnica, you can see that little stamp on the bottom. And I was in the office, and I hated it. Not only did I not speak the language, but I have still no skill at office administration, as my wife would have said. And um, I got shunted down to the warehouse where I ended up working as assistant packer to Vili, a man who worked on the Russian front. Uh, he was a drunk, and he'd get drunk during his day at house, regressed, and one time he pulled a knife on me. And then there was another fellow, Bruno, who smelt the urine all day long. He, was like, he'd, uh, he'd lost a leg to a German tank and rolled over his leg. And uh, there were various other people with guest workers from Greece. And I felt right at home, they were all the misfits. There was a you know, lankhead German death metal aficionado who took me along to see crap work. And you know, we, uh, we had a great old time. 
And then I, I took off and went on the overland trip. Yeah, you know, Istanbul, Isfahan, went up into the Karakorums and saw K2, went around India and came home and, you know, I had witnessed all the poverty in the third world and came back and went to university and uh, that's when I got back from India. And I got back and went to Bristol. Interesting, it's, um, it's very like Duke in a way because that's near Gothic Tower. Uh, it's called Wills Hall, and Wills was a tobacco company, Wills Whips. And uh, the, an awful lot of money that was made during the slave era. And Bristol was a port that was on the triangular trade route from England to West Africa, up to the States and Brazil, and then back, bringing tobacco. And the, you know, if you think the Poshers did really well, well, they built their houses and big estates, well, the, the tobacco companies even built universities, uh, like Duke and like Bristol. And that's it's our kingdom, Riddell's first, this first suspension bridge. And I'm standing in the middle of the back, you can probably make me out during college days. And that was what was going on at the time. And so that social ferment really got me thinking about everything. And, uh, and then, of course, somebody kindly gave me a copy of this book. And uh, I started looking at these parts. And, and, you know, in fact, it was all over. You know, the Bristol Museum, right next door to the geography department where I was a student, uh, had a phenomenal collection of Asian parts as well as the Bristol Mediolica Ware, and also studio parts made by Stan Hale, Leach Cardew, and the lot. And, uh, you know, you, once you've seen these and you get stuck in, it was, there's no going back. Uh, this is a part, I actually went up to Africa at one point, and this is a part from the village of Kwali, where Lali Kwali. Uh, it's from along with the Korean job. And uh, there's a great quote of Graham Greene's. Um, there's always one moment in childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. And that moment was when Kaiju had the opening of his retrospective exhibition at the Bristol Museum, which was right next door to Wills Hall and my job for the time. And uh, I went along and uh, the next day, there was a screening of Mother Waterman's biographic movie, and it turned out that he had been employed by my grandfather back in the 1930s as a designer. Henry Bergen, who was part of the whole Leech Circle, who was described as an American socialist, and beguiled Cardio, or said he should go up and design the industry and not be a bourgeois parasite living in the Cotswolds in, in, in Winchcombe. And uh, so, Dad took my grandfather took him on. This is the stuff that. Uh, cards you made, but it was pretty awful stuff. And one of the ironies was that as soon as Michael got to Spode, he realized that in fact there was a lot more really good craftsmanship involved in the manufacture of, of uh, Spode China, even within an industrial context. And that's something that Tanya Harrod in her book uh, refers to. Uh, and I basically had this choice to make between Spode's idealized 19th century landscape and the actual country parts that were being made in the landscape, that's a butcher dish. And, um, yeah, but I ended up chosen going down to Cartier's, and he took his revenge on Stoke by taking me. I jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. And there's pictures of Tom Roberts and I making clay back in the day, working at Wentford. Uh, you know, coffee on Michael's Winchkin jars down at the beach. There you go. And this is one of the, uh, this was with Michael's grandchildren, Eshi and uh, Eshel and Ara, and Tom Roberts and I, down at Dragadic. And this, uh, this I've got to, these are the strange juxtapositions that I had to kind of sort out because this is the house that the Copelands built down in South Cornwall, a place called Trilithic which is a National Trust home now with gardens that have got amazing rhododendrons. And I happened to be dating Spence, Spencer Copeland's stepdaughter at the time and uh, when I got my apprenticeship. And so I got invited to go down to this house on Easter. And I was in sort of full hippie regalia going down there. So I replied, I mean, drinking, I remember I drank 1895 port. And it was like, I, I sort of 
still, I, it was very peculiar. <laughs> now that's Jurassic from the side. But my reaction was to go to rebel against all of this. But I want to show you a few pictures of some other approaches that contemporary potters have had to industrial pottery, starting with Michael Eaton, who adapted neoclassical uh, Wedgwood vases and, and, and in, a in a series called Wedge Wouldn't. <laughs> Very funny. And then there's a guy, Ken Eastman, who has worked with Crown Derby to do these more abstract renditions of uh, industrial techniques and patterns. Uh, wonderful Linda Sikora up in Alfred, who's been very influenced by early stoke on track industrial work. And Mar Marek Sekular in Poland, who's sort of taken in industrial blanks and stuck them in a wood kiln. I think they're pretty neat. Uh, and Neil Brownsword, who's, uh, I think, Florence Foden, and he's been reassembling the old bits and pieces that are part of the residue of industrialism into sort of abstract sculptures. Uh, and Spode has now become the site of a biennial, kind of like Ensita. And I went there with my dad and took a picture of these pots that are made by somebody called Matt Smith. Uh, and this is a sort of conceptual piece that refers to work and uh, motion by a woman called Eve Masterman. And I must say that it's, uh, and this is uh, Paul Scott who has done these wonderful uh, sort of conceptual renditions of old patterns like Blue Italian. And there on the top it says very closed. And he basically superimposed images from around the factory on top of the old imagery. And uh, it's, uh, it's very sad going back to Spode these days. It's, uh, they've got a very wonderful museum, a very nice coffee shop, but you know, they're basically the height of their endeavor now is putting on Valentine's Day parties where they, they show the movie Ghost. And it's a far come down from producing 110,000 pots a week. Um, but I also, this is another example of what people can do with uh, an industrial, a more industrial sensibility. In fact, Alex Matisse credits me when he was beginning to think about changing his course from being a wood fired potter to be doing something more industrial. I apparently said to him, well, I said, you've got to start thinking like an industrialist. And uh, long and short of it is Alex and Connie and John Vigland, who used to work with uh, Daniel Johnson, my apprentice, who started this mid century modern style. Kind of Heath Ceramic Look Light Company up in Asheville called Eastwood. And they're, you know, they've got it figured out. They're making a lot of sort of simple parts that appeal to contemporary marketplace, but they're brilliant marketers. You know, there's Connie and her you know, and daughter Vita. And the, you know, they're very brave, very brazen, very bold in the way that they advertise and market on Instagram. And if you're not following them on Instagram, you should. And, uh, you know, there you go, that's, that's how you can sell pots these days. They're expecting a 300% growth rate next year. And they've opened a store in Atlanta, and they're just the one they've got out in Nashville. Um, and I want to close by going back. This has looked like the boogeyman in the way you can think of it, as, as you will. Uh, this is a little coder at the end. Uh, this is Sir Arthur Bryan who uh, became the first non-family member to head the Wedgwood Company from its founding in, 18, in 1759 to its sale in 1986. Uh, Arthur Bryan was born in a terraced house in Penkel, just around the corner from Spode's Mansion on Mount, and he started working after the war as a sales manager uh, 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 for uh, Wedgwood and became the chief executive in 1963. And eventually, against his wishes, the Wedgwood family floated the company company shares, taking it public for six million pounds. And King Arthur, as he was known, um, aggressively acquired smaller potteries like Coldport and Johnson Brothers, and quickly quadrupled the company's turnovers. In 1986, Wedgwood made a net profit of $39 million. And the company's success made it a target during the hostile takeover fever of the 1980s. And it was eventually sold for $360 million to the Irish glassmaking group Waterford, which incidentally that year had lost $29 million. 
And after the usual carve-up of the Wedgwood Group by various private equity companies, Wedgwood went bankrupt in 2009 after the financial crash and is now owned by a Finnish conglomerate. Um, so that's the preamble. Uh, this is Lawrence Bryan, who's a year older than I am, who's currently the managing director of Port Merrion, another one of the surviving and successful uh, Stoke on Trek industrial companies. So I'm telling this story because in 1976, while I was at university, I was invited to the 21st birthday party of Lawrence Bryan. And it was Black Tiber. Uh, and um, I had a friend of mine up from university. My mate Pete Goldie was from Croydon, it's not far from where Lisa lives. And Pete had a very gruff character, he had a very distinctive voice. And uh, you know, one time he worked on a dredge in the Bristol Channel, talking out nuts and bolts. And uh, he's got a catchphrase that we use to this day, which is, well, well let's have a sit down and have a think about this. And uh, Pete was, you know, uh, I luckily found him an ill fitting suit with mine and Muffrey trotted to party that happened to be in a house that my father had grown up in as a teenager just outside Barlston and they took us around the A34 and uh, we got there and it was very awkward and uh, alcohol helped and the music was playing but nobody was dancing and all of a sudden the song by America, the horse with my name came out and Pete and I for some reason liked that song a lot and we sort of went each other on the dance floor. And, uh, but we didn't belong. Uh, and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's my dad and my brother in stone in the house, turning around the terrace right now. And uh, that's the terrace going down the Methodist church that's empty. And uh, that's my dad, who's 99. He's my favorite potter. And um, I just want to go back to that slide because, you know, the iron, there's several ironies connected with all of us. For one thing, uh, Port Merion and Lawrence Bryan now own the Spode Patent Book. Okay? And they are manufacturing blue Italian back in Stoke. And uh, I'm over here. And, uh, but the, moral, the two morals of the story is, one is qualities that unify and glue. Kind of, it doesn't really matter and as long as the work's good, where or how it's made, in my opinion. And, and the other moral of the story is if ever you have to make really important life decisions, listen to a horse with no name. <laughs> Thank you. Take another short break or ask questions and come up and talk to me. Uh, we've got John Burrison up next.